All right, so in this video, I wanna show you how you can calculate the implied volatility uh, using the Black-Scholes model, uh, theoretical pricing model for options. In my last video, I showed you how to implement this in Python, as well as implement the Greeks using automatic differentiation. So check that out after this video if you're interested, but you don't need it to understand this video. I'll briefly overview the model for you. Basically, the idea is you have six variables that you can plug in to a formula that you see here to get the value of a call option or the value of a put option. The specific math and all of these things, it's really not too important, but what is important is uh, the meaning of these six variables. So I'll explain these to you here. And these D1 and D2, these are just separated out because they pop up in a few of these equations, well, both of these equations, and it makes the notation much nicer if you separate it out this way. So what are the six variables going into this formula? You have S, the price of the underlying for the option. So if it's a Tesla call option, S is just the price of Tesla stock. Uh, K is the strike price. If it's a $140 put, K would be $140. T is the time to maturity in years. So if it's six months out, it would be 0 0.5. If it's one year out, it would be 1.0. R is the risk-free rate. This is the return you can expect on your investment while assuming little to no risk, and it's usually pinned to something like a U.S. Treasury bill. Um, <clears throat> and Q is the dividend yield, which again, uh, you know, I have these five blocked off, and the reason I have them blocked off and separate from the sixth variable, the volatility, the reason these are blocked off is because these are pretty easy to look up, right? You can look up the price of the stock, the price of the, uh, the strike price of the option. You can look up the time to maturity, of course. You can uh, estimate the risk-free rate very easily, and you can usually get a good idea for what the average dividend yield will be over some time period, right? Can you do the same thing for volatility is the question. And the answer is no. And the reason that matters is because volatility is the variable that has the largest impact. Uh, you know, one of the largest impacts for the theoretical price of these options. And hedge funds, really what they're doing is they are buying and selling volatility, as opposed to, uh, you know, a retail trader will commonly be invested in some sort of directional strategy where they want the price to go up or down. Hedge funds will often be pricing the volatility, effectively buying and selling volatility and capitalizing on that in order to find mispriced assets or financial instruments. So the volatility is something we care a lot about. It's very important for these equations, but it's not easy to get an estimate for, okay? So let's look at the call option, for example. We have seven variables. So we have six here, right? And how many of them do we know? Well, we know these five. We don't know the volatility. And what's the seventh variable? Well, the seventh variable is simply the price of the option. And do we know that value? In some sense, we do. We know at least what the market thinks the price of that option should be, right? So we know the market price of this option. And how do you know that? You can just look up the what it's selling for. So in some sense, we have seven variables. Six of them are known. One is unknown. And so in theory, we should be able to solve for this volatility. And in other words, what we're doing is we're saying the market value of this option is implying that the value of the volatility is some number. And so that's why it's called the implied volatility. So you could think of it as the market implied volatility. <clears throat> but it's actually very hard to rearrange this equation and get a closed form solution for sigma. So, uh, as a fun exercise, how about you try it out and let me know how it goes in the comments. Um, but you really can't do that. And so we have to find a clever way to solve for this, okay? So here, what I have is the implementation of our Black-Scholes pricing model. Again, I went over this in the last video. It's very brief. Feel free to pause and look it over, make sure everything makes sense to you. And here, what I'm introducing is a loss function. So the idea will be that we will make some guess for the volatility, and then we will compare the theoretical price using that guess to the market price. Okay, and this loss function is going to be the difference between our theoretical price and the market price. And may maybe I should call this market. Let's call it market price. I think that makes it more intuitive. <clears throat> and so let me run these uh, cells here. 
So we just create our black shoals function. We, we create our loss function, which again tells us the difference between the theoretical price and the marketplace price. And what we want to do is we want to iteratively get a better and better guess for sigma so that this value goes to zero. In other words, we get the volatility that makes our theoretical price match the market price. Okay. And here, we will need derivatives of this function with respect to the volatility. I will show you that in a second. So if you've ever had an optimization class, you'll surely have seen Newton's method, sometimes called the newton raphson method. And the idea is that you can find the zeros or roots of a function very easily by doing this procedure. You make some guess for where you think that root might be, okay? And then you update your guess each time according to this formula. What is this formula? So f is the function you're trying to find the roots of. f prime is the derivative of that function with respect to the variable you are optimizing. And then xg is just your guess at the nth iteration, and xg n plus 1 is your next guess. So what you do is you keep running this until you are sufficiently uh, happy with the value you're getting out of this function. So in our case, f is just this loss function I have defined here, okay? And we want it to be zero because we want the theoretical price to match the market price. And again, this is just the theoretical price, p theory, minus the actual price, p actual. Now f prime is the derivative of this loss function with respect to what variable are we trying to optimize? Well, we're trying to optimize the volatility. And so, again, check out my last video if you want to know more about automatic differentiation. But this gives us that derivative as a function, which we can evaluate. So what I'm doing here is this is a function from Jax. It's the gradient function. We pass in the function we want the gradient of. And we pass in the argument we want the gradient with respect to. So 0, 1, 2, 3. Four. We want the derivative with respect to our guess for the volatility. Okay. And so we can sort of recast this Newton method formula in terms of our stuff. So our next guess for the volatility will be equal to our previous guess minus the loss function divided by the derivative of the loss function with respect to sigma. And this is a very well-known, very basic optimization algorithm, which benefits from having the derivatives and it can give you very good convergence to the correct solution. So how are we going to do this? What's the algorithm? The algorithm is pretty simple. First, we make some guess for what we think the volatility might be. It doesn't have to be too close. Two, we calculate that loss function, how far using this volatility, our, our guess for the volatility, how far is the theoretical price from the actual price. And if it's less than some value, then it's sufficiently close and we can say, all right, we're done. So if the magnitude of the difference between the prices is less than this epsilon cutoff, then we can stop. If it's not, however, we have to keep updating and getting better guesses for the volatility. So step four would be calculate the gradient of that loss function. And then step five is just update according to this formula. Simple as that. And then we rinse and repeat this until we get this condition to be satisfied or until we run out of iterations. Okay. So first, let's set up a scenario where we know what the volatility should be. So I made up some values here. <clears throat> $100 is the underlying, 110 strike, one year to maturity, 5% risk-free rate, and the 20% is the volatility, okay, that we should be able to obtain without foreknowledge of it. And so what we do is we get the theoretical price of this option using these parameters. Okay, and it's 6.04. So we're going to pretend now we have no idea what this value is. Okay. Um, but when we go through and optimize according to this Newton method, we'll plug in some bad guess for the volatility. And after some number of iterations, we will converge to the correct guess, which is 0.2. Okay, so what I've done here is I've taken this five-step algorithm, five to six-step uh, step algorithm, and I have implemented it in Python. So what do we need to pass into this optimization algorithm? We need these five variables, S, K, T, R, and Q. Okay, 
We also need to know what the market thinks the price of the option should be. And we also need some guess for the volatility. So I'm going to plug in a pretty bad guess. Let's make it even worse. Let's make it uh, 1.8. So this is very far, right? It should be 0.2. Uh, and then we plug in some additional parameters. This is the number of iterations we're willing to go through that five-step algorithm. Epsilon is how close we want the prices to be before we say it's close enough and we're done. And this is just to print out some useful info as it optimizes. Okay, so what do we do? Step one, feel free to keep referring back to the algorithm here, but all we need to do, step one, make a guess for the volatility. We've provided that to the function, so that's our first guess. Now we enter this loop and we're willing to do n either iterations, 20 of them. So we print out what iteration we're on. We compute the loss function, which again is just the difference between the theoretical price and the actual price <clears throat> using our guess for sigma. And then we print out what the current loss is. Now what we do is we check if that loss is less than our tolerance, epsilon, and if it's less than it, we're done, and we can simply return our current guess for sigma because it's good enough. However, if it's not, then what we do is we compute the gradient, step four in our algorithm above. And then step five is simply update our guess for sigma. So the next sigma guess is going to be the previous sigma guess minus the loss, again, just the difference between the theoretical and actual market price, divided by the gradient. And again, we used the jacks to do automatic differentiation to obtain these gradients. Check out the last video if you want to know more about that. And then it will just continue through this loop until we converge to the correct value. So what do we do? Let's go ahead and run this function and see what happens. So we're printing out the loss. So over time, this should be decreasing, right? So we go through iteration one and we're off by $56. So our initial guess for the volatility is horrible, right? We can even make this worse. We can make it, um, you know, let's make it uh, three, 4.8 and you'll see that the price is gonna be very far. So we're $92 away from the correct price. Over time, okay, maybe I made it a bit too far. Let's make it a bit more reasonable. We'll make it uh, 1.8. Should be a reasonable enough thing to converge to an answer. <clears throat> so. We're $56 away on the first iteration. We go through, we update the guess for sigma, and then on the next one, we're off by $20 about. And then on the next iteration, we're off by 75 cents. And then we're off by a fraction of a penny. And by the fourth iteration, we have converged to pretty much exactly the value for sigma, okay? In the sense that the sigma we input gives us the exact same theoretical price as the market price. So now all we need to do is print out the sigma and we know that it should be 0 0.2, right? So if we print out, we, we return our guess for the implied volatility. Uh, so we can just print out, calculate implied volatility. Let's do print, calculate implied volatility. And you can see that we get the correct value of 0 0.2. So this is how you solve for the implied volatility using the Black-Scholes formula. I hope you find this to be useful. I'm happy to do tons more uh, videos on the Black-Scholes model. We can do volatility surfaces, stuff like that. Just drop a comment down below. Let me know what you'd like to see. Maybe some more math, maybe some volatility surfaces, stuff like that would be really cool to do. But I'll, uh, if you stuck around this far, I'll say thank you very much for watching. I'm going to sign off for now. See you in the next video, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.